Well, a very good afternoon to you all, my dear brothers and sisters. It's lovely to be with you all around the word this afternoon. Now, our umbrella title for consideration this afternoon is the Shepherd King, isn't it? And it is that which we have attributed to this middle section, if you like, of Zechariah, which runs from chapter 9 through to chapter 11. It's a section of this particular prophecy that, for me personally, was particularly understood, which is one of the reasons I chose it for consideration today. And perhaps thus it's the case for us that the seven visions in the first six chapters, the enacted parables in chapters 6 to 8, maybe the latter-day prophecies of chapters 12 to 14, are maybe a little bit more well known. So we come then, don't we, initially to chapter 9, which we've entitled The Conqueror. And in this chapter, we have a remarkable contrast between two great conquerors. Two of the greatest conquerors, in fact, that the world has ever seen. Both these men led their campaigns from the front. Both of them were successful against incredible odds. Both had died by the age of 33. One of them, brothers and sisters, was the champion of sin, and the other, the champion of righteousness. That is the subject of Zechariah chapter 9 that we've just read together. And to get here in Zechariah's prophecy, we've already gone through, haven't we, the first eight chapters. We could say those chapters that deal with the prophecies concerning the immediate days in which Zechariah and Haggai lived. But when we come to chapter 9, we take a sudden leap forward in prophetical time. We leap forward to hundreds of years after Zechariah. We leap forward, in fact, to around 300 BC, And the first great snapshot of the future portrayed here in this book. So here we are, brothers and sisters, on the very cusp of the rise of the Greek Empire. We find ourselves among the belly and thighs of brass. We are here at the time of the rise of Alexander the Great. And as we have already intimated, this chapter speaks of both him and the Lord Jesus Christ and makes a contrast between them. There are some parallels here, yes, which we shall see. But in fact, this chapter is here to show the contrast between Alexander the Great and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a breakdown then of this chapter before we dig into the meat, as it were. In Zechariah chapter 9, in the first eight verses, we have a prophecy concerning Alexander the Great's campaign from Essos in Turkey down to Egypt and back again. Also known as the Palestinian campaign, right at the beginning of the rule of Alexander the Great as a world power, as it were. And we see right away then, don't we, why it is here in the divine record. Being the Palestinian campaign, as history records it, it is one that affected the Jewish people. Now it's fair to say from the outset, brothers and sisters, that I am by no means a history buff. Um, I was very bored with history at school, it's fair to say. But when it comes to history in the context of the word of life, my fascination increases incredibly. And so too, I'm sure it does for us. We're probably well aware that Alexander the Great was indeed the first king of the Greek Empire. And that under his leadership, the preceding Persian Empire 
was utterly overthrown. Now that didn't affect the Jews so much except that in doing so he came through the land of Israel which did in fact mightily affect the Jewish people. And although Alexander the Great isn't, of course, mentioned by name in Zechariah chapter 9, we know that it is him of whom it speaks by looking at the narrative and that which is recorded here for our understanding. If we start at verse 8, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 8, we see some context here into what's happening. And this is the Lord God speaking here, and he says in verse 8 of Zechariah 9, And I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now I have seen with mine eyes. And we note here, it's quite specific in the record. There is an oppressor to come, close to Jerusalem, and that oppressor, it says in that verse, is him that passeth by and him that returneth. This oppressor would pass by God's house in Jerusalem and this oppressor would return thereto at some point. He would come back to it. And it's clearly here speaking, isn't it, of a military power led by a mighty man. And we get further context, don't we, when we come down and have a look at verse 13. Look at this in verse 13. When I have bent Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man, against thy sons, O Greece. So the army recorded for us there in verse 8, that army, that oppressor that would pass by and return, is in fact the Greek army. And therefore, in the first eight chapters of Zechariah, chapter 9, we have a record of Alexander's invasion of the Holy Land. And we'll look at that in some detail um, in our first address. Verses 9 then through to 12 go on to speak about the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately we can see the contrast, can't we, here in these verses. Look at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the fall of an ass. There is a contrast straight away. The contrast to the Lord Jesus Christ riding on an ass. We know that Alexander the Great rode to Jerusalem on the back of a great war horse. Even its name has gone down in history, hasn't it? Eucephalus was the name of Alexander's horse. And by contrast, here is the Lord Jesus Christ riding into Jerusalem on an ass. We can see the parallel on one hand, can't we? They were both on horseback when entering Jerusalem. But what a difference and what a contrast in that horseback when entering Jerusalem. So both these men were conquerors. Both of them dramatically changed the world they left after them. Both had died by the age of 33. But that, brothers and sisters, is where the similarities end, isn't it, between these two men. At 32, Alexander the Great went to the grave, never again to see the light of day. Only the Lord Jesus Christ conquered even that. Alexander the Great was, of course, a man of conquest. In the space of ten years, he took over the entire area of the Persian Empire. And the Lord Jesus Christ was also a man of conquest, wasn't he? But a very different one, with his day yet to come, when he shall take over not just an empire, but the whole world. And the way he went about it was utterly different, as we shall see also. And then the final section of chapter 9, verses 13 to 17, looks then at the Lord Jesus Christ at his second advent. 
the ultimate victory, if you like, of Zion over Greece, as it were. Uh, we won't have time, sadly, to deal with this section uh, as well uh, this afternoon. So let's go in then with a bit of background before we dig into the chapter. Those of us that perhaps, like myself, aren't particularly history buffs, a bit of background to Alexander the Great himself then. He was born in Macedonia, which of course was in Greece at the time, in 356 BC. He was the son of one Philip of Macedon, who was a soldier and a statesman of some repute at the time. At the age of 20, when Alexander was 20, his father was assassinated. And Alexander assumed control then of Macedonia for a number of years. Now prior to the rule of his father Philip, Greece had been divided into separate states. They were all independent from one another. And Philip had conquered all of them except Sparta in the south, unifying Greece. The problem was that when Philip died, the whole of Greece revolted against his reign and the subsequent reign of Alexander, his son. So what a way this was to, to come to power. Alexander's first challenge was to quell the uprisings across the entirety of Greece. And this man did so within two years. He brought the whole of Greece to heel within 24 months. And it was at this point, with all of Greece now united under him, that the campaign began to bring down the Persian Empire. And now we need to go, don't we, from Zechariah to Daniel to understand what Alexander did, to understand the background here and to understand just what the Greeks thought of the Persians and why. Come with me to Daniel chapter 11. I'm sure you're ahead of me here. Daniel chapter 11. And going in straight away at verse 2. And this, of course, here is Gabriel speaking, isn't it? And to Daniel. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 2. And now I will show thee the truth, Daniel 11 verse 2. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So here is the problem. In Daniel chapter 11... There was to be a Persian king who was to stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And it mentions there, doesn't it, that there would be three kings that would rise up. And if we look to our history books, we understand that those kings were Cambyses, Smyrdis and Darius Hystaspes. The current king at this time was King Cyrus, and he was, of course, a co-regent at the time with Darius the Mede. So here we see there were to be these three kings. The Persian Empire had already begun by the time Daniel, under inspiration, gives us chapter 11. There were two kings on the throne, one Mede and one Persian. And those three further Persian kings that we've mentioned were yet to rise, and then there was to be a fourth, after Darius uh, Hystaspes. And that fourth king was, of course, King Xerxes. And as this verse here intimates, he was to be richer than them all. Indeed, he had inherited the wealth of all his forebears, but he also had the greatest army of any of the reigns in the Persian Empire. And true to what this prophecy says here, that he would stir up all against the realm of Grecia, that's exactly what he did. It was King Xerxes who attacked Greece. 
Uh, and Herodotus, the historian, tells us particularly of this attack. That there was a Persian army numbering five million strong, led by Xerxes into Greece in an attempt to take Greece. And yet that army of five million was unsuccessful because that army came to Athens. Now the Greeks weren't stupid. I think if you and I were faced with an army of five million, we'd probably do similarly to them. They ran away. They fled from Athens to the hills and they left the city uninhabited. And Xerxes was so incensed at this that the Greeks had run away, that there wasn't a battle for the city, that he set the city on fire and he razed Athens to the ground. He destroyed the museums, he destroyed the temples, he destroyed their altars, the statues, all of their history. He wiped it all out. And in turn, the Greeks were so incensed by this that from that moment onwards, they sought revenge. They hated the Persians. It's recorded in history that every Greek mother hoped she would bear the son that would bear up Greece and destroy the Persians. And that happened, didn't it? Daniel chapter 11 and verse 3. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And so it was, 130 years later, after Xerxes' invasion of Greece and his raising of Athens to the ground, that a mighty king indeed stood up against Persia. And verse 4 here in Daniel 11 cements this king as Alexander the Great. And when he shall stand up, verse 4, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. And we know, don't we, again from the annals of history, that at the death of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was split into four, the four winds of heaven. And it was ruled over by four of his generals at that time. So those four generals took over, and so in 333 BC, Alexander, the king of verse 3 here in Daniel 11, stands up. Finally, in response to Xerxes' sacking of Athens at the end of verse 2 there in Daniel chapter 11. Now, for the detail of this, of course, we need to go back again in Daniel, don't we? So come back with me, if you will, to Daniel chapter 8. There are words and a prophecy that we know very well indeed. The battle of the ram and the he-goat. Uh, speaking here, of course, in prophetical type of the conquest of the Persians by the Greeks. Uh, at this same time period we're considering now. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 3, we read these words. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but the one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him in the fury of his power. And we know, don't we, here that we have the overcoming of the Persian Empire by the Greeks. The two horns that are mentioned there on the head of the ram in verse 3 speak, don't they, of the rule of the Medes on one hand and the Persians. And we see that the one was higher than the other, it says, at the end of verse 3, and the higher came up last. We know that the Medes ruled for only two years. And that the greater rulership was taken by the Persians after them, who reigned for circa 200 years. 
uh, and that their empire pushed, didn't it, west and north and south in conquest. With armies into the millions, there were none that could stand before it in its heyday. And then came this he-goat from the west, with that notable horn between its eyes. And we're not left, are we, to interpret this ourselves. We're told in no uncertain terms of whom this speaks. Verse 20 of Daniel chapter 8. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Verse 21, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that, between, that is between his eyes is the first king. So here he is, Alexander the Great, that first king of the Greek Empire, coming now, moved with collar, running against the Persian ram. And we can see how he came and ran unto him, verse 6, in the fury of his power. This was revenge now on the part of the Greeks for the sacking of Athens by Xerxes. And we know too here of interest that the goat ran into the ram before the river. Did you notice it was recorded there twice in that, those few verses? It was before the river. Now there were many battles between Alexander the Great and the Persians... But there were three major victories that were accomplished by Alexander the Great and the Grecian army, which overthrew the Persian power. And all of these three great battles took place beside rivers. There was the Battle of Granicus initially, just after they had left Greece for the first time. Then there was the Battle of Issus about a year later, and finally, the Battle of Gorgamela, which again was a year later on. And all of them were beside rivers. Those three big conflicts that resulted in the complete destruction of the Persian Empire by Alexander the Great. And so almost as soon as they had left Greece under his rulership, the Greeks find themselves thrown into the Battle of Granicus against the Persians under a chap called Darius Codamanus at the time. Now they met on the edge of the river Granicus and the Persians had had time to prepare themselves for this battle. They knew that the Greek invasion was coming and they had already dug themselves in onto the eastern bank of the river. And they sat there and waited for the Greek army to cross the river to join battle with them. And as soon as they began to try and cross, they hailed arrows down upon them. And in fact, right at the beginning here, just after Alexander the Great had left Greece, they were almost undone. The Greek Empire was almost defeated at Granicus, if it wasn't for one crucial moment. Alexander got down from his horse, ran across the river... And on his own, ran straight at the heart of the Persian army. His soldiers, willing to protect him, followed suit. And in doing so, they overcame the Persians at Granicus. And we find that in terms of the historical annals, this happened time and time again. Alex, Alexander led from the front. He didn't ask his men to do anything that he wasn't prepared to do himself. He won battles this way over and over again. And this meant that he commanded incredible loyalty from his men. And they went on to destroy anything that got in their way. The Battle of Issus is another case in point. Just a year later on, the same thing happened. The Persians set in array numbered 200,000. And the conflict was so fierce that 100,000 of the Persians died. And the rest fled in disarray. In fact, they were in such disarray that when they fled, they left behind their wives and families in some towns. And one of those towns was Damascus. Remember that, brothers and sisters. We'll come back to it a little later on. And again, a year further on, at the Battle of Gorgamela, Darius had regrouped at this point 
And he put one million men of the Persian army onto the field of battle. Alexander came against them with just 47,000 men and won this third battle, the deciding battle in the crushing here of the Persian Empire. In 10 years, he had covered 10,000 miles. He had conquered the entire Persian Empire. And if we're still in Daniel 8 and verse 5, we note there, don't we, in verse 5 of Daniel 8, that the goat touched not the ground. Such was the speed at which he was travelling. Such was the speed at which Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire. But despite his prowess in battle, Alexander, of course, was very human and had many faults. He was a man of burning ambition. He wanted to conquer the whole world for no other reason than his own glory. And in this context, there were two titles that he wanted to have bestowed upon him. The first of those was the Son of God. And of course, in the context here of Alexander the Great, that would have been Zeus. And secondly, he wanted to be known as the King of Kings. That sound familiar, brothers and sisters? Now, to gain that first title, Son of Zeus, he went to Siwa, a little place in the Libyan desert, to see somebody known as the Prophet of Ammon. And the Prophet of Ammon was the only person who could bestow that title, the Son of Zeus. And he walked in and he walked out with that title. The second title he wanted was King of Kings. And the way he did this was that after a conquest, if a king made obeisance to him, then he left that king in power as a vassal ruler. And therefore he could be known as the king of kings, as it were. <clears throat> and he's well known, isn't he, as creating cities. I think I've counted uh, to date, there may be more, 13 Alexandrias scattered across the former Persian Empire in tribute to the destructive power of this man. So let's go in now with that background to our chapter, Zechariah 9. And in verse 1 here, we have some interesting words. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 1. And we notice here where the burden of the word of the Lord is. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus shall be the rest thereof, when the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be toward the Lord. Now, we notice here that Damascus is mentioned by name, uh, the land of Hadrach, the land to the north of Israel. And so, we see here the Persian tactic in battle, specifically at the Battle of Issus now, was to take all of the Persian army's wives and children and possessions into battle. They weren't there to fight, but they were placed into towns behind the battle lines. The Persian soldiers, therefore, would give their all to win. Otherwise, the enemy, on breaking through, would come straight upon their families and their possessions. At the Battle of Issus, Hamath and Damascus were the towns in which the families of the Persians were holed up during the battle. And we know, don't we, that Alexander won. And rather then than heading east into the Persian Empire, he turned south which could have been disastrous as far as the Persians were concerned, as he comes straight to Hamath and to Damascus. And he finds the wives and the children and the possessions of all the soldiers. They even found Darius's wife there too. And he treats them respectfully. If said, if any in the army were to treat any of those women which they found as in war... 
then they would have their heads cut off. And therefore, they treated them respectfully. And we notice verse 2, they came then to Damascus, then they came to Hamath, verse 2, uh, also shall border thereby. And then we come to Tyrus and Zidon, though it be very wise. And so, on conquering these towns, he moves further south. And then continues against Tyre. This was, of course, originally built on the mainland, we're probably well aware. But the city was attacked by Nebuchadnezzar, as recorded in Ezekiel 26. And the city then moved to an island about a mile offshore. Now, the Tyrians weren't going to be attacked again. Not only did they move to an island surrounded by the sea, but they also built 100-foot walls of stone around the island to protect them. Tyre, at this time, the capital of the Phoenician Empire, was supposedly impregnable to anybody attacking it. And the Tyrians were essentially running the Phoenician Empire from this island. And verse 3 of Zechariah 9, And Tyrus did build herself a stronghold, and heaped up silver as the dust, and fine gold as the mire of the streets. They thought they were invincible, didn't they, the Tyrians? Until Alexander the Great comes and knocks on the door. And he asks them to submit, to open the gates of the city to him. And the Tyrians refused. So Alexander here sees red. We may be aware of, of what he did. He commands that the city is to be destroyed and he builds a causeway to the island, not just a small path, but a causeway wide enough to take siege engines right up to the walls of the town. It took them seven months to build. His generals begged him to stop. At the night, at night time, the Tyrians came out from the town and set on fire many of the ships of the Greeks that were there. And as we read in Ezekiel 26, they used the debris from the old city to build out. They pushed it all into the sea and they got out to the town. And they made an utter end of Tyre. There was not one person left alive in Tyre after the conquest of Alexander the Great because they would not bow to him. And then we see, don't we, behold, verse 4, the Lord will cast her out and will smite her power in the sea. And there it was, Alexander the Great smote her power in the sea and she shall be devoured with fire. And verse 5, the Philistine towns now come to see it. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited, it says. And we notice here that those Philistine towns saw it and feared, and rightly they did too. If Alexander the Great could do this to Tyre, this massively fortified island, what could he do to them? And so too those Philistine cities fell. And you notice something here, in the record here, nothing's missed out in the word, is it, brothers and sisters? In chapter 9 and verse 5, the king shall perish from Gaza, it says, doesn't it, there, in verse 5. Why is this mentioned? Well, Gaza was the most fortified of those cities there. Um, and it was the last obstacle, in fact, before Egypt. And it took Alexander two months to defeat Gaza. The king at the time was a man called Betus, who was a very valiant king and fought well. And in the past, Alexander had honoured his opponents, even if he had defeated them. But he demanded that Betus would fall at his feet, so he could maintain his title, the king of kings. And Betus wouldn't. And so he caused him to be put to death quite brutally, in fact. 
and Alexander was becoming a very brutal man here, with every victory, he was becoming worse and worse. His ambition was increasing. And in fact, all of these towns fell to the point that this was to be the end of the Philistine civilization as it was. Those people who had plagued Israel for so many years had never recovered their national identity after the conquest of Alexander the Great. And we notice that in verse 6. And the illegitimate shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Interesting here, isn't it? They were illegitimate. And the idea here isn't in terms of wedlock, as it were. The idea is in terms of bloodline. There were no longer any pure Philistines alive in the world after this conquest. And we notice that in, in verse 7. And I will take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. But he that remaineth even he shall be for our God and shall be as a governor in Judah and Ekron as a Jebusite. That blood, that Philistine blood. Many of the Philistines that remained, in actual fact, converted to Judaism. They were absorbed into Israel, brothers and sisters especially at the time of the Maccabees that was to come. And we notice they would be a governor in Judah, it says there, doesn't it, in that verse. He shall be, as, verse 7, a governor in Judah. That word governor there is better translated as tribe. They shall be a tribe in Judah, as it were. They were to lose their identity. They were to become absorbed into the household of Israel. And we note there also, it says, an Ekron as a Jebusite at the end of that verse. The Gentiles who survived in Jerusalem. That's who the Jebusites were, weren't they? And they had to convert if they were to live. We're well aware, aren't we, of Ornan the Jebusite, who came to the truth, and in doing so, it saved his life. The Philistines then were destroyed after this, and those that were left became subsumed into Israel. And we notice in verse 8, I will encamp about mine house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall pass through them any more, for now have I seen with mine eyes. So Alexander came through Israel to go against the Philistine towns, and then he returns to Jerusalem. He passed by to destroy Gaza, and now he returns to Jerusalem, which is exactly what happened. Now, the Jews were terrified. The Jews, in fact, had supported Tyre against Alexander at the time. And, of course, Alexander knew that. And he, was, he knew of their loyalty as he came against Jerusalem. And Josephus records for us in his annals what happened. He says that it was a winter's morning when Alexander and his armies rode to Jerusalem. Alexander was at the front on Eucephalus, his horse, and he was met by an amazing sight. That as Alexander approached the city of Jerusalem, the gate swung wide open and out towards him came the high priest in full regalia, followed by the Levites all in white blowing trumpets. To the utter astonishment of all his men, Alexander dismounted from his horse and bowed himself to the ground before the high priest. His officers thought he'd gone mad. Parmenio, one of his most trusted generals, asked him what he thought he was doing. And Alex replied, that when he was in Macedonia, he had a vision of that very man before him, the high priest, telling him to pass over into Asia to conquer the territory of the Persians. And that if he did that at that time, then he would be successful. 
And he says that man was him. It was the high priest who he saw in that vision. Now who knows, brothers and sisters, what he actually saw. But that is what history records. And Alexander then walks into the city with the high priest. He didn't destroy it. And he allowed the Jews to continue to practice their religion. To worship the almighty God in the Greek Empire. Now Josephus is the only record historically of this happening. There are other historians who have questioned it. But whatever the case... The question remains as to why Jerusalem wasn't destroyed and why the Jews weren't forced to Hellenise like the rest of the conquests of Alexander were. They could still practice their religion in the middle of the Greek Empire. And then Alex continues, doesn't he, to conquer all the way to the east until eventually his army had had enough and they mutinied. And they said they weren't going any further at the Indus River on the borders of India. And he returns then and he sets up the capital for his empire. Where? In Babylon. And there in Babylon he dies of injuries he has sustained during the war. And that is it. That is all the record in Zechariah tells us of him, isn't it? Because then as we move on now into verse 9, we leap forward again, another 300 years into the future, into the first century. And in verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, he is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Another king is coming, and brothers and sisters, look at the contrast here. This man is not on the back of a war horse, he's on an ass. He is just contrast. He is having salvation contrast. He is lowly contrast. He is riding an ass contrast. And here we see these two men juxtaposed, don't we? Alexander compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, they were parallel in one sense. They were divinely appointed, we could say. They wanted to be, or were, the Son of God. King of kings. Dominion from sea to sea. They led by example. They established a following. They died by the age of 33, but as we said earlier, that is where it ends, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Alexander was violent and unjust. The Lord Jesus Christ was the opposite in justice. Alexander was arrogant, he was egotistical. The Lord Jesus Christ was lowly. Alexander rode that war horse, the Lord Jesus Christ rode the ass. Alexander declared war, didn't he, on the nations. The Lord Jesus Christ, what did he do? Look at verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen, unto the nations. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Alexander declared war. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke peace, didn't he? Alexander enslaved the world to him. What did the Lord Jesus Christ do, brothers and sisters? Verse 11. As for thee also, by the blood of the covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Sent forth the prisoners, brothers and sisters. The pit with no water. What is that a picture of? It's a dried up well shaft, isn't it? It's a place where they would throw rubbish. A place where they would throw dead bodies. A place where they would put prisoners from whence there was no escape. It's a picture here of being saved from the grave, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Alexander the Great 
died in Babylon. The Lord Jesus Christ died in Jerusalem. Alexander was unable to save. What of the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters? Look at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of uh, Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Brothers and sisters, having salvation. And look at the margin. Saving himself. Alexander died 10,000 miles from home, never to see the light of day again. The Lord Jesus Christ saved himself and all his followers. And the point is this. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to Jerusalem, riding on the ass, what did the people of Jerusalem want, brothers and sisters? They wanted him to come and to destroy the Roman overlords, to lead them in battle against the Romans. And when Christ comes riding on the ass, they wave the palms in front of him. They, they straw their clothing in the way, don't they, before him. What were they doing, brothers and sisters? Come with me to the second of Kings chapter 9. When the Lord Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem, what were the people doing? Here is the principle, 2 Kings 9 and verse 11. This is the time of Jehu, of course. 2 Kings 9 and verse 11. Then Jehu came forth to the servants of his Lord, 2 Kings 9 11, and one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow to thee? And he said unto him, Ye know the man and his communication. And they said, is it false? Tell us now. And he said, thus and thus spake he to me, saying, thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then they hasted, verse 13, and took every man his garment and put it under him on the top of the stairs and blew with a trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So when the children of Israel strewed their garments in the way in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, they saw him coming, didn't they, as a king. They laid their clothing before him and they saw him as the next king who would come and would destroy the Roman army. They thought he was riding into Jerusalem almost as Alexander the Great to destroy that Roman Empire. And when he didn't do it, brothers and sisters, they killed him. Didn't they? He wasn't the kind of king they wanted, was he? He will be at the second advent, but he wasn't then, was he? And here is the irony. It wasn't the Romans who invented crucifixion. It came from Persia. It was learned by Alexander the Great. And he taught it to the people of Carthage, from whom the Romans learnt of it. Alexander was the one who taught the Romans, if you like, how to crucify people. The very method by which the Romans killed the Lord Jesus Christ because they had no king but Caesar. Crucify him, crucify him, they cried. He's not the kind of king that Alexander was. He was not the kind of king they wanted, was he? And with this in mind, brothers and sisters, come with me to the New Testament now, to Mark chapter 8. A lesson for us as we draw our thoughts to a conclusion here. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. Mark 8 verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him, the Lord Jesus Christ, Mark 8 verse 34, with his disciples also he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And note this, brothers and sisters, verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Verse 36. 
For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What did Alexander do, brothers and sisters? He gained the whole world, didn't he? But in doing so, he lost his own soul. He died a young man, 10,000 miles from home, never to see the light of day again, in contrast to the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to save and not to die for the benefit of others. Alexander only fought for himself and the destruction of men. And at this point, at this juncture here, the Jews never appreciated that they ought to have lined up behind the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, were incensed that he wasn't the conqueror they wanted, and they killed him with crucifixion. And so too, brothers and sisters, we are called to follow the character, are we not, of the King of Zion. And in our own bodies, we are to mortify the natural characteristics of that king of Greece day by day. For indeed, brothers and sisters, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? 